Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to yet another episode of the Pure Digital Passion Podcast with Moses Kemi Barrow. Today, my guest is Chief Nyamwea, somebody I've known for probably the last 10, maybe 15 years. Um, initially, I got to know him as somebody who I believed was an illustrator or comic book uh, creator. And he's told me recently that they actually his role is much more multifaceted. Uh, but he's going to share with us his journey as an artist and somebody who's doing really amazing things and also even operating in the NFT space. Uh, Karibu sana, Chief. Asante sana. Thank you for having me. So let's talk about origins, Chief. Uh, I've known you well, maybe 10, maybe almost 15 years, mm -hmm. you know, back in the day when we all used to hang out a lot at the iHub. Yes. That's when I think we first encountered each other. Yes. And I think I remember you making a presentation in one of the events uh, around what you were doing then. I think you had a comic book that you were creating. But I'd like us to go back a little bit further and maybe tell us a little bit about the origins of Chief Nyamwea, who, of course, you have a very interesting name being Chief. I'd like yes. to hear more about that. Uh -huh. But give us early days growing up, you know, getting into this passion of drawing and comic books. Where does this all begin? Mm -hmm. So um, I grew up very normal household. Um, all my, my siblings are professionals, either working in banking or uh, one is an uh, investment banker, um, lawyer, very conventional careers, and I was also on, on the same path. Uh -huh. um, this is in Nairobi? In Nairobi and also in Eldoret. I did Eldoret, most of my yeah? high school in, uh -huh. in Eldoret. So you grew up in Eldoret? Uh, you could say so. I came of age in Eldoret. Okay. Most all my teenage years were in Eldoret. Okay. So I came back to Nairobi to go to the Kenya school, uh, uh, go to Nairobi University in the okay. Faculty of Law. You were uh, going to be a lawyer? Or you a lawyer? I actually finished the law degree, uh -huh. um, you know, went to Kenya School of Law. Are you kidding me? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It <laughs> yeah. was very, very conventional. Yeah. 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 Art was just something that was done as a hobby. Yeah. And that was uh, the area that it was it was supposed to be. So as, growing up, were you the kind of guys who doodle were you yes, doodling yes, in your yes. books and making stuff like that? making more Kenyans for your studying, you know? Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> All those uh, I never knew that making more Kenyans would be a transferable skill. Okay. That you could one day, you know, make comics. Uh, so yeah, it was it was very much uh, you know grow up, get a corporate career, make a life for yourself. But then, um, because of many different factors, I think also the time that I graduated, graduating in two thousand and seven, yeah, um, I became a little bit disillusioned with with law and the ability of law to impact society, especially you know at the end of two thousand and seven, early two thousand and eight, we saw a period where the rule of law just evaporated, mm. and it forced me to ask some really deep questions. So I was never quite the same, you know, I never quite saw, you know, the role of law the same way. And I felt like the knowledge which we had had to escape the academy. It had mm. to go out into the general public because there was a lot of valuable history that we were given there, knowledge of like land tenure systems, things like this. And it was not getting out, you know, it was just an, 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 a, very, closeted thing, huh? a yeah, very insular conversation. So I kept my feelers out, even when I was uh, attending Kenya School of Law. Um, you know, I would see these advertisements from the Godown. The Godown was quite young at that time. I remember, were, yeah. Yeah, and they were saying, oh, you know, make make comic book art and, you know, you can win this prize or whatever. So I applied for one of them. I never won the prize. But something, you know, something was triggered in me. I remember, you know, I, I went, I made it, I was shortlisted. I made it all the way to, you know, going for the interview and everything. And just the process of, of making that comic. It was a simple four-page comic. I realized that, man, you know, I could actually do something with this. And I was also reading um, uh, Britain's Gulag at the time. Uh, I had these fantasies about what it would be like to 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 be alive during the emergency, mm, and mm. I got the idea of of, of doing a comic in uh, about the emergency, about the emergency period. So I made my first comic in 2010 uh, called Emergency. Uh huh. Yeah, that was just uh, me. It was very much like a PhD project, just researching, looking at images of. So it was rooted in fact and history at the same time. Uh, part fact. Basically, what I did was I drew a timeline of Dedan Kimathi's life. I was like, okay, what are the things we know? We knew he was a Second World War veteran in Burma. We knew that he came back to Kenya this time. You know, there was, there was something about him leaving the military, having problems of like insubordination. Mm. There was a time he worked at Kenya Forestry Department. So basically, you just get, you plot things on a date. And then in the gaps now, you, you, you take creative license. Like, what if he had a friend when he comes back to Nairobi? What sort mm. of conversations do they have? Mm. Uh, so I was already playing with fiction. And yeah, I published the comic in October of 2010. And it was well received, much better than I expected. You know? And this is a hard copy printed? It everything. was online. It was a web comic. Web, web comic, okay. okay. So that's what really got me going. That was my first project. 
I want you to take two steps back here because uh-huh. I'm, I'm getting a little bit confused. I mean, so your guy, up until this point, you're now a lawyer. You mm-hmm. probably, were, were you still doodling? Were you still drawing things? Were they just for fun? Yeah, you, I was just doing it for fun. So you were not make... like formally trained? You didn't go to an art school at any point? No, I mean, okay, I had at one point taken a month in Shangtao while I was in... Okay, the while design in, college, in yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, which was really good. I met, uh, I met the, you know, the late Alan. And, you know, now that I reflect on it, Shangtao was actually a really good school, you know, because they, they taught from fundamentals. Whatever branch that you were going to go into in animation, they made sure that you started with illustration. Okay. That you could, that you could draw, you know, understand yeah. the human figure, understand the different types Proportions, of characters. Proportions, all that, yeah. This is a pugnacious character. This is a... Like, oh, okay. so understanding so basic, story the basics, design, yeah? understand how cameras work, okay, uh, understand the basic uh, editing tools like Photoshop, uh, Illustrator, all these things, yes. Um, and with that foundation, basically, they were teaching you how to learn, learn how to learn, yes. Um, there are many other things like uh, it's very hard to talk about your life. Uh, Steve Jobs always used to say that the dots connect retrospectively exactly they don't don't connect going forward so there were always little signs that i was going to end up with this career another thing would be that uh, i forgot also to say that i was a chartered accountant also i also studied concurrently uh, uh, currently i I did i finished acca yeah well so uh, there was once i was doing a stint in scan group working in the accounts department in no way yeah uh, and, you know, being there with all these accountants, the creatives were the coolest people that you could imagine. I always used to see them at the distance, you know, walking by. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I would talk to them and, you know, one of them was was kind enough to give me a copy of Photoshop 7 at the time. Told me, go play with this if you're interested in what we do. So I always had this window into the life, even though I myself was not in the life. This is so bizarre. I mean, mm-hmm. lawyer and accountant. Yes. And... Somehow this was there in the background. Yeah. Would you say you're a classic product of those situations where, and I, but they, I was meant to do medicine or pharmacy, uh-huh. so don't even ask me what happened there. Ah. Uh, but more importantly, was it possibly a big portion of your life was fitting or conforming to possibly what the parents expected of you at some mm-hmm. point? You did what was expected of you, mm-hmm. but deep down there was this other passion that maybe seemed like a hobby, mm-hmm. but was the very thing that you were supposed to do. Could it mm-hmm. be something like that? Uh, it would be disingenuous of me to put the blame entirely on the parents. Not the blame, but just the idea uh, that you were, you were following the route, you were following the the path. Uh, what I would say is that the scope of poly- possibilities that were available to us you know, as kids growing up in the 90s, yeah. wasn't that broad. Yeah. You know, films, comics, this type Medicine, of thing. Those were things yeah. that happened in America, far yeah, away. Yeah. For us, what the scope of possibilities were was lawyer, doctor, medical, you know, engineer, engineer whatever. Yeah, yeah. But then, um, obviously, the fiber comes in. You know, we, we, we are the first, like, internet generation, digital natives. You're seeing all these possibilities coming in. And then your window starts to... to the career starts It's to like happen. the aperture starts to, to widen. Exactly. So... Exactly. Now the question just becomes, are you going to have the courage to take a leap? And for us, I don't think it's an isolated thing because I know many other people who have a similar biography. So many people in the blogging space and, you know, like yourself wanting to do medicine. At that time, especially, you know, 2008 coming forward, there was a lot of experimentation. So many people who had careers going one way, ended up in, in, in creative Absolutely. roles. Yeah. So we were, the, we were the first who saw this opportunity open and we decided to, you know, just roll the die. You know, some of them worked, some did not work. And, you know, there are some of us who are still doing it a decade on. So yeah. let's let's go back again. So you you you, you launch Emergency. This is a mm-hmm. webcomic. So you build a website, you presumably yes. upload it, mm-hmm. you share it to the world, mm-hmm. you, you see people getting interest. What happens next? Wow, it was so cool. You know, I was lucky. Uh, my next door neighbor was actually a, 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 a computer guy. He was a really cool guy in a hobby. And he was also a writer. But okay. like any any tech problem I had, I would take to Nahabi. So he's the one who even helped me build the website. He would also double up as uh, my editor, you know, giving mm. critique on where the story didn't work. And, you know, we just play computer games together. Very good friend. We actually ended up doing another comic together. Yeah. So uh, he helped me a lot in building the site and, you know, early days of understanding. And I was also blogging at the same time. So I would do okay. the comic and then I would blog on like Mau Mau topics, you know, okay. how people feel about this. So you went this. deep into the subject matter. Went really deep into the subject that was my whole thing with comics my comics for me were just a medium it was a medium for you know unpacking 
you know different subjects uh, many different subjects which is what I've, I've i've never stopped doing the mediums change now we are talking about nfts and what not but the basic principle was the same that how can you take subjects that are a little bit alienating mm. where people have a hard time getting into them and how do you break them down into a way that you can explain it to a teenager i mean if we're talking about emergency for instance just as a as a subject matter and i think mm-hmm. there's a famous line or quote that says that you know i think it's something to the effect of you know at the end of the, the a particular transition in a, a period after a war and all it's the victor mm-hmm. that tells their side of the story mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but on in this in the case of say the mamaws and so forth then what you were doing i presume is you are now bringing possibly a different perspective yes from a you know the shall i call it the other side yes. as opposed to the conventional wisdom right mm-hmm. yes. of the same that was part of what you were doing that right? was the plan yes awesome yeah. and we were lucky at the time that so much literature was was now emerging you know so much new information was coming out you even had the court case happening in london yes. now people know more about things like uh, you know operation legacy you know how many rock, uh, records were destroyed around the time that the empire was collapsing wow. so all this information was coming out and i was like no 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 this should not be trapped in the academy this needs to be in a popular in popular fiction because that's what people consume so you basically uh, curated it yes. repackaged it and put it out there exactly fantastic yeah. and the medium of choice was the comic style yeah Okay. So what happened after that was that you know many people just started sharing it. I think for me what really surprised me was the moment that uh, Questlove of the Roots no way. ended up re- retweeting. Are you kidding you me? Know, he wow. he retweeted one of the of the blogs that I'd written and sent people to the to the comic. I was like, "Oh my god." I think he was involved with OK Africa at the time. Okay, okay. So I never expected that was a weird thing about the internet. I never expected that, you know, how how network effects work, you know, how things kick and other things so, get viral as well yes yeah. so after that with a little bit of that momentum i figured like how do i do this in a much more sustainable way because after four after four issues of emergency i was totally burnt out totally like i was like, i have to i have to find a way of you know attaching some sort of business model to this so that mm. I, can, i can do this so that i can live uh so so is this at this point a part time thing mm-hmm. did you have a day job how is this working at this point uh, at that time uh i was doing it full time yeah okay. uh, but it wasn't a very long period i spent most of 2010 just researching and I was also a student at the time okay. don't forget uh yeah so I spent a lot of time researching um now this is now where the tension now started with my parents because they could see how much time was was being diverted it's like mm. are you still are you still a lawyer you know mm. uh, but luckily um Victor Ndula recommended me to 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 the higher ups in the star and it was like maybe we can do a comic with this guy and that ended up becoming a four year uh, comic that i did with the star i had a six panel daily comic so five days a week very demanding uh, so it's like a full time job yeah that? basically that became a full time job and i was able to i was able to you know earn a living for for that time uh, but even as i was doing that i thought like what else can we do how how else can we do comics because it was so demanding like basically i was chained to my desk all the time just drawing 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 um and you're doing everything you're doing the illustration you're doing the narrative no everything. no no nahabi was writing the comic okay, okay. so the comic was called roba uh okay roba yeah, okay yeah, yeah. is a character he is, is a character basically he was this guy it was crime fiction crime fiction was a genre i grew to love mm. uh because i loved working with black ink noir yeah i've seen know, that in your style eh? blood and guts type <laughs> 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 that was, that was the genre that i fell in love with Isn't that similar so, to like the 300 yes, uh, graphic exactly. novel Frank the original Frank Miller style? Yes. Huh? I'm very influenced by that group of people. Yeah. yeah. And there was no color involved. It was just Indian ink. Just Fantastic. Indian ink on white paper. Um yeah, very dark using a lot of high contrast. Fantastic. So Roba so, is this guy. Yeah, so Roba was the one which I did with the star. And uh, after doing that for about four years, um, in about 2012, I met uh, another friend of mine called Hatu, who had just graduated from Cape Town in animation. Oh, and he was already, you know, doing animation. He had a small group of guys who who they were doing a lot of interesting animations with. And I was like, why don't we start a company? Why don't we start something up? So with Hatu, we started in two, in 2012, 13. There, we started a company called Tsunami. and it was one of the early animation companies and basically we had a vision to just do stories in in an animated format and grow the the profile of animation in 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 Kenya mm. and you know from comics to animation it's a very transferable skill 
you know, they're very adjacent to each other. Okay. So I just immersed myself. Um, I would do a lot of storyboarding in the studio, a lot of directing. And, you know, we ended up doing a lot of client work. And it was a huge learning experience. I learned a lot doing that. And, you know, the quality was good. Hato was a very, you know, professional person, knew how to, how to organize workflows. Because when you're doing comics, it's, it's a small team and you're most of the time just working yourself. But with animation, it's a team sport. You don't you don't do animation alone easily. You've you got know? to have other people doing different bits. Eh? And if there's any delay at any point in the pipeline, it it's knocked all the way down the line. Wow! So it teaches you teamwork also. Uh, but then, of course, there were challenges that you know I didn't anticipate. I realized challenges with the market that uh, it's not just as easy as as working with corporates. And you know, I realized that probably even working with corporate, which at the time seemed like the high water mark, you know, like that's mm. where you're supposed to be. I realized that that's a very losing strategy because uh, in the market at the time, people didn't know much about animation. They would get stunned by the by the budgets. Uh, they, uh. They, they, they had this assumption that animation is supposed to be cheaper than, than uh, film, which a lot of time was not true. Um, you know, and you're counting by the minute. They were a lot of the time surprised by the timelines, how long it took to, to make them. And these were early days. You know, now it's getting better. The technology is getting a lot better now. There's also more appreciation on the client side, I guess. There's a lot more appreciation. And also we've gone a bit more global. So we are not limited to, you know, to, uh, to, to, to this market only. Okay. Now it's much more. Actually, I would say currently at Freehand, which is uh, the company that I run currently as creative director, I would say 90% of the work we do is not local, it's, it's global clients. So um, yeah, there was a lot of learning at that stage. And you know, we really struggled to, to, to remain solvent with, with those challenges. And we got moved away from, from what our priority was. Our priority was to tell stories, similar as I had done in emergency. But mm. very, very soon, you find yourself turning into an ad agency. Mm. which is uh, quite unfulfilling creatively. You don't tell the stories that you want to tell. You find yourself, you know, describing products, you know, which is fine. It, it's fine if, if that's your objective. But if your objective was, as it was for me, to tell stories, it was very limiting. So I found myself taking a hiatus in, in 2016 uh, to kind of learn more. I, I wanted to deepen my education because I was like, if I'm going to dedicate my life to this, I want to, I want to know more. You know? yeah. And I felt like the gap that was missing in my education was more about technology. Mm. Um, and so I started, uh, I took some time. I went, uh, you know, I went back to Eldoret, to Charingani, where my parents mm. found is, Spent a bit of time there. Um, and I also, I was on the internet applying for stuff and I applied for a scholarship to go to a place called Singularity University in San Francisco. Oh yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, it was a very interesting institution because they didn't want um, they didn't want conventional people. <laughs> I don't know how, uh, how to say it in a different way. They got multidisciplinary people, people from many different disciplines. You had, you know, uh, technologists, you had uh, lawyers, you know, uh, but all of them were looking to the future and to see how to integrate uh, exponential technologies with solving, you know, grand challenges that affect a million people and more. Mm. And I met so many different weird and interesting people. So now you actually went, you went to... I went there. So I, I, I won the scholarship. Oh, eventually. fantastic. So that was in 2016, mid two thousand, about the summer of 2016. And I yeah. went there and, um, it was also, an, you know, it's like life is an onion. The more you keep opening it, the more you realize how, how unexpected what lies at the other side of the onion yeah. is, you know? So I, you have all these ideas about Silicon Valley and, um, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was very, very different. Um, and I learned so much in a very short time. It was such a dense and compacted rabbit hole that I'm even, I'm, I'm even scared to open that rabbit hole in this conversation because mm. it'll end up dominating. <laughs> but basically you, you had a whole new perspective but on things. A then. whole new perspective about what technology can do, about how to scale things, about how to, how, how, how to do things uh, at scale and how to think also in terms of business models, how to, how to experiment effectively, how to iterate, how to know, and also how not to waste time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, and also that was the place where I met uh, my, my co-author for Trust, uh, my latest graphic novel, mm -hmm. Anne Connelly. Mm -hmm. That's where I met her. She, her passion was blockchain. Everything. And I, at the time, I didn't even know what blockchain was. You know, um, it was like Greek to me. You know, they were talking all these things about blockchain, 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 crypto, whatever. And this is what year is this? This, is this was 2016. 
Wow, that's a while ago. <laughs> yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah. And she seemed to connect it to all these various different problems in, in, in many different disciplines. And, you know, I would ask her questions, but those are just early days. So I came back to Kenya end of 2016. Um, uh, 2017, I started working on a new book because my mind had just been blown being out there. And I was like, uh, I need to make sense of this at home. It's one mm. thing learning about all these technologies when you're in San Francisco with the abundance of capital that they have, an abundance of, 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 of um, human resource and, and, and whatever. It's quite another thing making sense of those things here. And for me, mm. it was very, I, I, had, I didn't want to, to, to live in the US um, for my own reasons. Uh, mm. So I came back home um, and I started writing. You know, I started writing and, and, and trying to weave what I'd learned with our current, you know, social, technological, political, other challenges. And I wrote a book called Art of Unlearning because I felt like that's what, I, that's what, that's what my life was, was involved, you know, in order to make space for all these new things I was learning. There was so much that I had to unlearn because the two did not integrate how, how we were trained in school, our, our attitude toward education, for example. For them, it was just move fast, break things. You know, that, mm. that Silicon Valley ideology, move fast, break things, um, you know, very creative. It was uh, that if you're going to do something truly creative, by definition, you're unqualified, you know, mm. so give up displaying your CV and that type of thing. The, the, the most valued knowledge was experimentation, uh, which is very different than the 844 our own 844 ideology, where for us in Kenya, our ideology, credentials are absolutely everything. We want to know how many papers you've stacked up before you even open How many mouth. master's degrees you have. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I, I put this in a book. I wrote a book called Out of Unlearning, and, you know, I did it in my own way. My style is... is did it have is, a comic style as well? It was a comic. The, full, full. The thing was a comic. It's a, it's a full, full comic, and it was a beautiful book. Um, I did it out of Nairobi. I, I, I moved out of Nairobi. I stayed away from Nairobi for about uh, two years to just have peace and quiet and be able to think deeply because um, the speed of our city, it's very, the, the city is very fast, frantic. You wake up in the morning. Um, yeah, there's, there's something about when you're living in a city, you move with the momentum of the city. You, you wake up with the matatus, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> you, you wake didn't... up with the noise of the matatus. And these were deep things I wanted to think about, like, you know, technological unemployment. What does that mean for us? You know, um, future you know, of work. Future of work. We are trying to industrialize using the Singapore model, but the Singapore mm. model was implemented in the 1950s. You're living in 2022. Is it going to be as labor intensive? Is, are, are those strategies going to work? I mean, when you work? talk about labor intensive, I mean, you I'm know. going to segue on that. I mean, yeah. just last night I came across uh, a tool called Notion, which I'm sure you've mm. heard of, mm -hmm. but they now have some AI tool that you mm -hmm. literally put in a title, yes. say create a podcast about, uh, create a blog post about this <laughs> and it'll auto-generate a blog post. Yeah, and the same is affecting our industry as well. And I'm, I'm sure like, you've seen... are you kidding me? You know, now yeah. you only need bloggers. You'll have AI that can do that. That's incredible. But anyway, yeah. this is a distraction. The same that, yeah. has also happened with like illustration and making art. You've seen Mid Journey. It's getting automated, huh? Mid Journey and Starry Eye and all these things. Mm. So those were the things in 2017 that I was thinking about because what they had done was give me a window into that future where, you know, we really have to to move where our emphasis is, especially in education. I, I suddenly started spending a lot more time thinking about education than I'd ever done before. Um, and so I published the book, entirely self-published. Of course, there's no infrastructure for publishing comics in Kenya. We don't have any comics publishers. Um, so my entire career in, in comics in Kenya has just been self-publishing, you know, just... Uh, when you self-publish, what does that mean? Does that mean you, you go to a local printer? Do you do it mm -hmm. in Amazon? Do you, yes. How do you do it? So there are many ways of doing it, depending on the scale at which you want to do it. Like how I self-published out of unlearning was very different than trust, just because of the resources that were available. With trust, there were a lot more resources. So I was able to be on all the platforms, Amazon, have an NFT collection and whatever. But with trust, I did not have much. I, you know, yeah. uh, with trust, it was just me, my pen, you know, um, working with ink in a, in a notebook and, and, and not even using, not even drawing digitally because drawing digitally suggested that uh, you have electricity to plug in. And that time I was living nomadic. Oh. <laughs> so, and also that was, uh, there was another thing about that, that um, technology can also be quite distracting mm. because of how powerful it is and how fast moving it is. It can also alienate you from yourself. 
and you lose sight of the things that make you unique. So it was very important for me that even as I was grappling with these themes, that I do it in a way that is very grounded. And for me, holding a, holding a brush in my hand and doing it on a paper is very grounding. So um, that's, how, that's how I did Art of Unlearning. And Art of Unlearning did well. I was able to sell it globally. I, I, I did a, a crowdfunding campaign and there were contributions from, from everywhere, Argentina, where, where, where. Um, and I shipped it all over the place. And one of the buyers, was my former classmate uh, in in uh, Singularity, Anne, mm-hmm. and Anne loved the book. You know, she loved how I was able to to translate these themes into a very simple format, um, and that's what I was doing. And uh, with my wife, we we decided to to start a company. One of the chapters of Art of Unlearning was called Freehand Movement because I had a movement of people who, you know, um, were following this same idea that I was telling you about that grounding ourselves in. In, in in the real world, you know, free, free hence freehand drawing. Mm-hmm. So I called that chapter freehand movement, and then that ended up becoming the name of the company that I founded in in 2018, which is the current studio that I'm creative director for. Yes, and uh, so um, so Anne read the book, and she was like, "I need to do a book like this on blockchain." So twenty. She's still on her blockchain story. Yeah, she's still on her blockchain. She's never stopped even now. <laughs> <laughs> she's part of like blockchain faculty yeah. in Boston University and and the rest. Uh, anyway, so she came to Kenya in 2019. You know, early days started talking about the story. Um, I was skeptical at the time. You know, I just come from 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 selling out of and learning, and I was like, am I going to dedicate another three years of my life to a topic that I'm not really sure about but she was so committed she was like i'm going to make you student number one you know if you can figure this out then you know we can we can make some headway so i just i just went in with an open mind um with the attitude of a researcher that i'm not going to be an evangelist yeah i'm not going to be like those crypto evangelists who tell you oh you must buy this buy this buy this and then mm. you have a, a, a <laughs> you, you, you like you you hear all this I, I was skeptical because of all these, you know, collapses. And, the, the, and, there's a hype also, the uncertainty yes. around it. And a lot of frauds were happening, especially yeah. with the ICO things in 2016. A lot of people were starting companies just with a website and, you know, people send their money and, you know, a, a month later the thing is shut down and gone. That was very common. So there was that skepticism that I don't want to evangelize something in Kenya and attach my name to something that I'm not 100% sure of. Yeah. So I had to become a student myself. What is what is blockchain first of Back all? Back to basics. What huh? is its utility? How does it make a difference for for people living in 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 like Eldoret, Cherengani? Mm. You know, um, and and in the course of learning, uh, with Anne, we now started thinking like, what's the best way to attach this to to a story? What's the best way to translate this into a story? And uh, and again, you're unpacking something complex and yes. making it simple, which is what I've done throughout my entire decade long. So career. you're a curator, kind of. You're a Storyteller. Yeah, you, you, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. That's what storytellers do. If I had to define my, what I do in one word, it would be a storyteller. The mediums change. Sometimes it's drawing, sometimes it's writing, sometimes it's neither. Sometimes I'm neither drawing or writing. I am, I am helping other people with their creativity using my own experience and, you know, creating that context. That's what a director does. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, depending on what the project is in freehand, I, I occupy, you know, different hats. So in this one, I was, um, you know, just researching, research, and in the course of researching those ones, I was going by a Maasai market and I saw the, the necklace and I was like, wow, you know, is there a way we can connect the idea of, of, of visible language, visual language? Um, you know, like, you know how they do a lot of data visualizations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I was like, uh, this was, this was a, a visual language before there was any of this data science and before there was even computers, people were able to, 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 to encode information and, 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 say, and share information uh, visually with each other. And you had this uh, all across Africa, you had this in many different um, uh, Ornamental forms, yes. with masks, with beads. With Even other like, is it, the, is it the South Africans who have those beautiful, sort of blocky, graphicy mm-hmm. designs? I don't know which tribe it is, whether it's a Kosa, one of them, but mm-hmm. amazing the beads and all exactly. that. You know, yeah. yeah. Or even uh, like they would make cowrie shell. Um, cowrie shells themselves were currency. Yes. And how they'd all be weaved into different items. Exactly. And, and different currencies being utilized for different functions. Some functions were ceremonial, others were, you know, like 
things like um, during weddings and other things. And this all predates what we exactly. do today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it was very important for me that I ground the subject be without the computers in this context. Mm. Like what was there in our life as Africans that was analogous to this technology so that you can start from there and now move into the, the more complex mm. things. I've, that's always very important for me to start from uh, first principles. So yeah, using that idea, I came up with the idea of Wahengaland, land of the ancestors. Uh, and uh, I, create, I, I created basically this universe uh, where there's a guy who's trying to take over Wahengaland, which is the country where the, the lead character Mora is from. The mm -hmm. guy's called Max. And um, he's trying to do that by forging the land titles. Oh. Uh, so that he can basically grab the land and force the indigenous people off, off the land. And the entire story was a struggle to, to, to stop him. And one of the things that happens with the, with the lead character, she's a whistleblower who discovers that he's trying to do this. And she, 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 she tries to disrupt him. And one of the people that she teams up with, well, a group of people that she teams up with when fighting him is uh, a group called the Sankofa Collective. And, no they are, way. and they are a group of hackers. And one of the things that the hackers are using is, is, is blockchain. And um, the reason why I chose land titles is that it's a, re a really good use, chain, uh, use case for, for, for blockchain. Uh, I don't know if at this point it's a good idea to talk about what blockchain actually is and how it would weave into that. I think so. Maybe uh -huh. for the audience and the people seeing this, maybe mm -hmm. in a very concise way, we can okay. talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, the way I understand it, and I'm sure they're, 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 they're you know, more well-versed people who will correct me, but the way I understand it, it's what's interesting about the blockchain is the, is the architecture of the databases, that there are different ways of, of, of creating databases. You can have a centralized database, uh, similar to what to the ones that Safaricom have, where they they keep all our transaction records in a in a centralized way, and we trust Safaricom to mm. to to mediate on our behalf to provide that trust. That if if you send money to the wrong person or whatever, the Safaricom in the middle will correct. Sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then these decentralized databases, similar to what you have with uh, Bitcoin, where there's no Safaricom in the middle. Mm. There's no middleman uh, mediating. It's just peer to peer. Yeah. Uh, basically, that was it. And um, you know, it, it for me the the philosophical conflict in the story of trust, where, which you're holding in your hand, maybe you can you can display. <laughs> you saw it here first. Yeah. The philosophical <laughs> conflict was that now that um, centralized architecture versus decentralized architecture. And it was very much a, 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 an argument, a, deba a debate between those two um, perspectives. And there's a very basic way of looking at it. You can just look at it basically from database architecture to even a political, um, to, to a political argument, which was also very interesting for me. Mm. That uh, if you want to look at it also from a political perspective, what we have right now in our governance is a very centralized uh, governance system. And the reason for that is very simple. Our technology did not allow us to have a decentralized governance. You know, uh, our representative democracy was created at a time that the fastest thing that could move was a horse. So if you're governing a large territory like, uh, you know, the European states, which, which are the ones that came up with this system, yeah. if you had a very large territory like France or Prussia or whatever, what you do was you pick who among you, or, or somebody would pick, maybe the king would pick or somebody would pick, like who among you can represent, you know, and then you send that person off to a, to a capital city mm. far away that since you know us well and you know you're good, you go and represent us, you know, and there are many problems with that. Even if you have somebody with the best of intentions, there are many problems with that. First yeah. of all, I mean, just to, if you take the example of like, if you pick a man, which was most of the time what happened, if you look at like uh, our first president's cabinet was entirely men, you know, from corner mm -hmm. to corner, yeah, mm -hmm. all men. So now when you have a situation like that, if, you, if you're sending one person go and represent us, what do they know about reproductive health? It's not going to be a priority. It's biased already. Yeah. So they don't even have to be malevolent, just their own subjectivity limits limits the number of issues that they're able to, yeah. to, to, to prioritize. Yeah. Um, that's even before you count issues of uh, conflicts of interest and, 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 and corruption and people prioritizing their own families and whatnot, which obviously is there. 
So I feel like, um, you know, this is an ongoing conversation that we, we have the technology to decentralize even our governance a lot more, but we are trapped in the, in the architecture of the 19th century where yeah. we, are, we are supposed to figure out who among us is the clever one that we are going to elevate to be our, <laughs> our, our messiah, basically. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we are trying to get out of that paradigm. For the longest time, like in Kenyan democracy, we've been trying to get out of that paradigm using legal means. Mm. But I feel like more attention needs to be paid to how we can get out of that paradigm also using technological means. Mm. Because we, we have this, you know, supercomputers in our pocket that we're able to do so many things with. You know, we order pizzas every day. And, you know, these are Kenyan software engineers who are doing this. It's not yeah. coming from outside. Yeah. You know, we're able to deliver pizzas to our house and other things. But, um, you know, with governance, we're still not there yet. You go to our bureaucracies. And I, I don't know, like, I'm not sure if it's a question of design, deliberate design, or whether it is, it is, um, you know, and, and to some extent, it doesn't matter if it's deliberate or, 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 or just a question of incompetence. But, you know, the, the most basic things like, you know, getting identity documents getting land titles. Yeah. Why do you have duplicates of, of why, why do you have duplicate titles and uh, no one knows on, which one is on the same or parcel? Yeah. Um, you know, or, or if I am, if I am a, a bad actor, I can, you know, pay some middleman somewhere or some person to make a file disappear. All those problems disappear when you have a decentralized, uh, database, architecture, which is a blockchain know? basically is. And, uh, the reason why I'm not sure that it's for lack of knowing is because there's been a blockchain task force in Kenya. At the highest level, this information is known, you know, um, and, you know, there's information that um, a lot of resistance comes from internally from these bureaucracies, that they mm. themselves are beneficiaries of, of this centralized architecture, the ability to make files disappear. And, you know, I mean, if, if we can just dial back a little bit, when I look at something like eCitizen, for example, mm. Mm. It, it works really well, you know. You, you apply for birth certificate and everything, but then there's that last mile challenge where you have to go physically to you know <laughs> why not why not it be that you could just get it delivered if you if you if you had a good enough system to get it this far that you that you get your birth certificate issues why not take the next step and have it delivered but there's something about being able to go to that central registry and then now that's when the bad actors have a chance to get their hand in mm, your pockets you mm. know um, but i don't want to speculate too much i i like uh, basically what the book does is that um, it 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 just explores all these themes about centralization versus decentralization, the role that blockchain can play. Uh, it, uh, in the story, there's a little bit of use of, of, of Bitcoin, um, exploring cryptocurrency, and you know, just opening up, opening up the, the possibilities to take somebody from, as they say, from zero to one, knowing nothing, to knowing something, that if they now want to take the next step of researching, if um, uh, they, they, they're able to do so. So what you're doing is you're basically you're contextualizing it. You're, you're, you're sort of presenting it on a, on a plate, exactly. as it were, in a way that people can actually appreciate and understand. Exactly. Uh, and in that way, hopefully, you start to trigger the thinking, use the storytelling to sort of maybe challenge their own um, uh, biases or their own notions around how things are meant to work mm -hmm. versus how they work. Exactly. Uh, and then from that point of view, it sort of starts to trigger possibly changes in the way people are doing things, or even possibly they start to demand certain changes going forward, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and ideally they themselves become agents, you know? Um, everybody has a place that they can get in. Uh, we don't all have to be software engineers. Yeah. I have engaged with this uh, from my own perspective as a digital artist and as a storyteller. Um, and everybody has to, everybody has to find from their position where they are standing, how to make sense of the world around them and the technologies that are available to them. And, you know, really that's, uh, that's, that's how I see it. And that's what I hope my, my stories inspire people to do. Fantastic. So tell me, how can somebody get a copy of Trust today? Yes. So go to trustgraphicnovel.com. Mm -hmm. And from there, all the options will be available to you. Um, you can either buy it um, if locally, you can buy it with Mpesa. Uh, internationally, you can buy it uh, with Amazon. Um, it's also as an ebook as well. Presumably. It's also as an ebook. The ebook is available for free. Okay. Because okay. the bet that we, we were taking there is that, you know, um, let's make the information available for free 
for the people that actually love physical books which there's a surprisingly large number of people who still cherish the the reading experience you know mm-hmm. of, of mm-hmm. reading a comic book it's it, it's its own medium um they will buy the 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 physical book but like this one. the ebook is available for free there's also a, a motion comic which is basically an animated comic um you add a layer of sound like you know music soundscape all those things and then the third thing is that it's also an nft collection which is uh, 8 out of 10 sold out. 8 <laughs> so, out of 10. So there are like two NFTs remaining for NFT collectors. People who have Ethereum wallets, they can be able to to collect those as well. And yeah. Uh, Does so, that mean you're the first publication possibly in Kenya that has an NFT component to it? Mm, Could you be? I'm not sure, but it's definitely one of the early ones. One of the early ones. Yeah, pro- I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a group of NFT community called Bogia NFT in Kenya. I've the Kenya it, NFT yeah. community on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, they do a lot of... Uh, they, I'm sure they were very early adopters. You know, Kenyans are so fast. <laughs> And then the other thing you were telling me is that this is also available in Kiswahili, right? It's also available in Kiswahili. We did a launch in, in Swahili Box in Mombasa. Fantastic crowd, man. Fantastic crowd. Yeah, awesome. I was so amazed like uh, the energy that is there in Mombasa and the passion that uh, young people have in Mombasa is similar to what we experienced in in you know like back in the IHOP days yes, the sort of a few years ago the yeah. sort of wide-eyed expectation we had that can change the world. Yes, that's very much where Mombasa is. Fantastic. Um and yeah this, the Kiswahili version is also available as an ebook and yeah the the idea is just to is just to get as many people you know talking Onto about trust possible. as possible and if i could say one thing about the name trust the reason why i called it that is that um uh, i feel like that's the main that's the main thing being addressed by by blockchain you know uh being able to trust without necessarily having an intermediary um and yeah trust trust is 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 a big thing for me you know like uh, especially when i compare coming from eldoret coming back to nairobi and seeing how there's something about modern living that is so alienating that you can live as i do near a supermarket and go in there a thousand times and each time you go to that space you're still a stranger mm. you know and 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 um yeah and really grappling with those themes also from a social perspective great yeah. so tell me uh what's 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 next you know i'm curious mm-hmm. to know maybe around any other projects you're launching mm-hmm. Uh, other things you're planning to do uh, mm-hmm. through these mediums and otherwise what what were you looking going forward mm-hmm. yes uh, so trust was for young adults the people that would be drawn to it even the art style is mostly young adults people in their late teens early 20s or even older i'm okay. hoping i'm hoping you'll enjoy I'm it i want to read it uh, but i grew I up also, loving comic books so i'm going to read it yeah i'm also very passionate about kids content myself uh-huh. i have i have two young boys oh nice um, uh, i'm passionate about kids content under the age of 5 Uh, so as a studio freehand studios we are we are we are launching a new project very soon called Uli and Tata mm. Uli and Tata's nursery rhymes African nursery rhymes mm. and the, the the project came from us you know not being able to find content on YouTube for our own kids you know so you just find this stuff like baby shark coco melon whatever and we were like we need to document our own nursery rhymes our own wow. our own songs Um so we got funding from the Kenya Film Commission and the first the first set of rhymes we were, we we documented was in Kakamega. Oh nice. And and we were like it's a project that has really weaved in very interesting team. We we are now becoming a bigger and bigger and bigger collective because it's almost like a wiki project. You can't collect nursery rhymes alone. Everybody from their own community brings knows, them in. You know? yeah. So uh, we just started as a pilot in in Kakamega. We went there spent uh, we split ourselves into two teams there was a visual team and there was a music team so the music team went and they were researching with the with the show shows and going to the wow. to the primary school the it was Bondeni primary school i believe um and just collecting this even a, a partner that we have with a part of national and is in vernacular in kiswahili vernacular yeah purely vernacular, vernacular. Wow. kabisa 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 wow. pre christian Pretty Christian. We need to document those things because these things are disappearing. We take for granted that these things will just survive, but we don't realize how fast Kenya is urbanizing and even in in our school systems how how teachers are transferred all over the country and our grandparents are also dying. For people of our age we don't see it, but for the kids coming up they don't necessarily have the same access that we did even to their own uh it's a big part of identity yes indeed so we we as a visual team spent all our time in kakamega forest um you know learning the history there was an ethnobotanist who was walking us around 
you know, telling us about how um, Bantu people came through the Congo forest, how Kakamega was, you know, more closely connected. And, you know, you see this 800 year old trees so huge that the root starts at, at 10 feet and how these are fragile ecosystems. So like, I realized very quickly that my God, we think we are making animation, but really what we are doing is archiving. We are archiving our knowledge. And we need to get out of that mind frame where we think of culture as something that is imprisoned behind a glass in a museum. Culture is not what is in the museum. It's, it's lived, the things yeah? that you're living day mm. to day. And if they are not part of your day to day existence, they are not your culture. I'm sorry. You know, they are just not. Baby shark is, 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 is your culture. That's what you're interacting with. Yeah. So um, that's, that's very exciting. We're very excited about that. Uh, inshallah, we'll be going to Rwanda soon. To, uh, for the discop to uh, okay. uh, as part of the the launch circuit for Ulian Tata okay and you can find out more about that on freehandstudios.com well chief thank yes. you so much it's been a pleasure i i came into this conversation thinking that we're going to discuss in a certain tangent you've taken me on a completely different one <laughs> and i'm so delighted that i have a copy of this thank you for giving me this copy you guys by the way this is also um where's the signed page yeah look at that can you see that so I got a signed copy of Trust. If this thing becomes like mega bucks down the road, I'll be one of the lucky people to have this. But thank you so much, Chief. I really appreciate it. And all the best going forward with the Freehand Studios and all your projects. Thank you so and, much. And, and more importantly, I just love the way you broke it all down and how you connect you know, storytelling to technology, the blockchain, and all the amazing things you're doing. Thank you. Well, that's it, guys. It's a wrap. Thank you once again for joining us for another edition of this podcast, Pure Digital Passion. We hope to catch you in the next one.